Hello students, welcome to Baiju's IES. Welcome to our discussion on economy this week, wherein we'll be covering and analyzing various important articles that have appeared in different business related newspapers. For the discussion, I'll be taking articles from Business Standard, Hindu, LiveMate, Business Line, etc. And the time period for which I'll be covering the articles in this particular video will be from 26th October to 1st of November. So let's start with the first article. This particular first article is related to NRI bonds. Now some of the important basic concepts that you need to understand are one, what is this concept of a Federal Reserve meeting? What is the impact of this particular meeting on India's Forex reserves? Or to be more precise, impact of uh, the Fed meeting on the Forex reserves in India, on the current account deficit, trade deficit, interest rates, so on and so forth. Now basically understand this, the Federal Reserve is nothing but the central bank of America. Just like RBI is for India, the Federal Reserve is the central banker of America. And this particular central banker, just like RBI, will be conducting the monetary policy meetings. These particular meetings are basically called as Federal Reserve meetings. Now usually in these particular meetings, they will decide upon what should be the interest rate. Should they increase the interest rate? Should they decrease the interest rate? Or should they maintain the status quo on the interest rate? Now please understand, one of the impacts of the Federal Reserve meeting is on Indian exchange rate. How does this particular meeting affect the Indian exchange rate? For a simple reason, there are various investors, that is overseas investors in the stock market who have invested not only in the debt market, but they have also invested in the securities market or equity market. Now, whenever the Federal Reserve meeting will happen, and if they decide to increase the interest rate, it's a simple indicator that the money flow in the US market is very higher. There's a prospect of a better growth rate in the US market, hence to avoid overheating of the market, that is to contain the inflation rate, usually we see that the Federal Reserve will increase the interest rate. In the recent times, this has been referred to as the Fed tapering. Post 2008 and 9, the Federal Reserve decreased their interest rates and since there has been a revival in the US economy, they have started increasing the interest rates. Post 2008, the Federal Reserve decreased the interest rates so as to ensure liquidity in the market, availability of the capital at lower interest rates and once there has been a revival in the market that is post 2013-2014, the Federal Reserve has been increasing the interest rates. This particular process is called as Fed tapering. It is also referred to in nominal terms as a tightening of the monetary policy. Now, whenever there has been a tightening of the monetary policy done in case of USA, the foreign investors or the overseas investors who have invested in the stock market will basically withdraw their investments, take the dollar out of India. But in the process of withdrawing their investments from the Indian market, the exchange rate will get affected and the forex reserves will come down for India and the stock market will also get affected. So basically whenever the Federal Reserve meeting happens, there's a fear of all of this worsening for India. And whenever there has been an outflow of the dollars because of the Federal Reserve meeting, RBI has stepped in and has controlled this particular situation. So please remember this, whenever there is a Federal Reserve meeting in the corner, there will be certain discussions about uh, what kind of volatility it will create in the forex market as well as the stock market. Apart from this, another very important concept that has been there in the newspapers in the last couple of months has been the concept of NRI bonds. Now please understand, NRIs play a very important role in case of uh, Indian market. NRIs will contribute to Indian economy in the form of remittances, they will contribute in the form of FPI investment in India, FDI investment in India, in the form of NRI deposits. Now this particular concept of uh, the NRI bonds is a part of uh, the NRI deposits. Now please understand, in the last couple of months, we have seen that 
Indian rupee has depreciated, that is in this year alone, Indian rupee has depreciated by more than 13%. One of the ways of controlling depreciation, that is by bringing in dollars into Indian market, can be done by issuing these bonds which are referred as NRI bonds. Now, why will an NRI invest in these particular bonds? The feature of NRI bonds is that usually the tenure will be from 3 years to 5 years. Second very important feature, the whole amount can be repatriated. Now, what do you mean by repatriation? Basically, understand this. If I am an NRI, if I invest, let's say $100 in case of an NRI bonds, and if I get 10% interest rate on this, I can take out all the $100 plus $10, that is the interest amount after the maturity of this particular NRI bonds out of India. There will be no restriction on my taking out of these particular dollars by government of India. That is a simple term called as 100% repatriation allowed in case of NRI bonds. And the third and very important feature of NRI bonds is that these are tax free. The earnings on these particular NRI bonds usually are not taxed by government of India. So whenever there is a depreciation of a rupee, it will give an incentive for these NRIs to invest in the Indian market through this particular concept of NRI bonds. It's a win-win situation for both NRI investors as well as the government of India. Why? NRI investors will get higher returns and the government of India will be able to bring in huge amount of dollars into Indian economy when there is a depreciation of rupee. That is a precise reason you will see that there will be a discussion on NRI bonds whenever there is a, a depreciation of rupee which is happening in the market. And at many points of time, the government of India has decided to go ahead, get the consent of the RBI and issue these particular NRI bonds in the market. We have seen that in the year 1998, after the imposition of sanctions by US, because of the Pokhran test conducted by government of India, there were sanctions imposed by US and that is a point of time when we issued these particular NRI bonds. One round worth $5 billion were proposed in 1998. Second round, 2000 worth $5 billion were again proposed in 2000. And third time in the year 2013, when there was a huge depreciation of rupee going on, RBI as well as government of India went ahead and proposed the concept of FCNRB bonds, which was proposed at $30 billion, but ultimately government of India raked in around $34 billion in the third round of these NRI bonds. Now, please understand these kind of bonds, the experts say that should be used as a last resort to control the rupee decline. Why? For a simple reason, no doubt at this particular point of time, you will be able to bring in huge amount of dollars into the market and control to a certain extent the rupee depreciation. But the banks which usually issue these particular bonds will be bearing the brunt in the future at the time of maturity if there is a further decline in the value of the rupee. Because please understand, if a value of a rupee declines or depreciates, the repayment liability on these particular banks will be much, much higher when these particular bonds will get matured. That is the precise reason whenever these kind of bonds are issued, these banks will be allowed to hedge their risk in the market. Now, why it is there in the newspaper? As already mentioned, the rupee has depreciated by more than 13%. The government of India, RBI, both have implemented a host of measures to control the rupee. But there is still a worry that if the Federal Reserve further increases the interest rate and the crude oil prices in the international market increase, then there will be a further outflow of dollars into the foreign market that is outside the Indian market, which will affect the forex reserves as well as the exchange rate of rupee. So in this particular context, there has been a discussion with respect to these particular NRI bonds. As already mentioned, three different type of NRI bonds have been floated already. Now the government of India is in discussion with RBI. Should we float the research in India kind of a bonds or should we float FCNRB bonds? Now the argument in this particular article is that the government of India is thinking of floating these kind of bonds. And the features will be as already mentioned earlier. But again, having said so, the experts have stated that uh, this particular concept of NRI bonds should be used as a measure of last resort when after trying out every other measure, 
the Indian government has not been able to control the rupee depreciation. So this is a discussion with respect to this article. The next article is related to farm credit. Some of the basic concepts are one, agriculture loans. The loans or the credit given to agriculture sector will be basically arriving or will be given from two sources. One is a formal source and the informal source. If a loan is given to a farmer by an RRB, a universal bank, small finance bank, primary agriculture cooperative society, all of this will basically be examples of a formal source. Whereas if the farmer gets a loan from a money lender, a zamindar in the village or friends and family, these will be the sources of informal credit to the agriculture sector. Now apart from this, what is the important difference? In case of a formal source loan to agriculture sector, the payment or the repayment is done by the farmer with a certain time period. That is a schedule of repayment is provided. Whereas in case of informal, the schedule is not usually given. The recollection methodologies are most of the times illegal and the rate of interest is exorbitant in case of informal sources compared to formal sources. But having said so, as per NSS of 70th round, it states that 40% of the rural credit, especially which goes to the agriculture sector, comes from informal sources. This has been happening for a simple reason. The farmers find it very easy to get the loans from informal sources rather than formal sources. In case of formal sources, there's a concept of a paperwork, there's a concept of a approaching the manager for which the farmer has to travel, there's a concept of a waiting period before the loan is sanctioned, there is also a concept of a, the amount at the maximum amount of loan which will be sanctioned. Whereas in case of informal sources, the waiting period is absent, the money lender or the zamindar is present in the vicinity of the village itself, so on and so forth. That is a precise reason the farmers in a rural India usually fall into a debt trap because they take a loan from informal sources, rate of interest are exorbitant, they are heavily dependent on the monsoon or the market prices. Whenever these kind of systems will fail, there is a huge pressure on the agriculture sector and the farmers will fall into a debt trap. Third one is the government of India has announced the concept called as an interest subvention scheme. This has been in implementation very recently from the year 2017. What is the concept of an interest subvention scheme? Usually the loans which are given from formal sources to agriculture sector will fall under two heads. One is called as a crop loan and the second one is called as a term loan. Some of the books will mention these particular loans as a short term loans, medium term loans and long term loans. Usually the short term loans will fall under the concept of a crop loan wherein the loan is given for immediate usage or immediate consumption. For example, loans which are given for purchasing of fertilizer, seeds, insecticides, etc. Whereas in case of term loans, these are given for creation of an asset. The concept of interest subvention scheme is applicable to the crop loans. The rate of interest that is usually applicable on these particular crop loans is 9%. The government of India says uh, rather than imposing a rate of interest of 9% on crop loans, the effective rate of interest that will be applicable will be 7%. That is an interest subvention of 2% will be given. Now who will pay this particular 2% of interest subvention? This is paid by government of India and the farmer has to pay only 7% rate of interest. But within this scheme itself, the government of India has imposed or implemented another very important provision wherein it says uh, if the farmer makes a timely repayment, that is the farmer ensures that uh, the part of the loan which has to be repaid, he does it uh, on time, then the government of India says further interest subvention of 3% will be provided. That is the effective rate of interest that will be applicable on these particular crop loans on these particular farmers will be 4% rather than 9%. This particular scheme is called as interest subvention scheme. Now this is there in the newspaper for a simple reason. There have been certain concerns which have been raised by various experts with respect to the farm credit information that is available in the domain. The government of India whenever they announce these annual budgets or the union budgets will allocate a huge amount of a spending under the concept of a farm credit. That is the crop loans or the loans which are given to the farmers. For example, 
For the financial year 17 and 18, Government of India has set up a target of issuing loans of total amount of a 10 lakh crore to the farmers. As per the information that is available, the experts have stated that out of this particular 10 lakh crore rupees, around 7 lakh crore rupees has been issued in the form of a crop loan. That is up to 70% of this particular 10 lakh rupees has been issued to the farmers in the form of a crop loan. But what about the remaining 30% of these particular loans or the amount? In what way or in what form has this been issued to the farmers? That particular information is not available. The experts fear that the banks would have issued this particular 30% that is up to 3 lakh crore rupees to the MSMS sector in any other form then reclassified them under the concept of uh, the farm loans. In simple terms, these particular loans are not actually reaching the farmers, they are being used for some other measures. That is the fear of the experts in this particular article. So this is a, a concept related to farm credit. The next article is related to MSP as well as a loan waiver. Let's try and understand both of these particular concepts. MSP is basically a minimum support price, that is the price which is announced by government of India for around 23 agriculture commodities, which basically means that this will be used as a floor price. In simple terms, whenever government of India announces an MSP for any crop, it basically expects a market to purchase these particular crops from the farmers above this particular floor price or MSP. Or else another definition of MSP is uh, the price at which government of India will be procuring the food grains from the farmers or the producers. But having said so, does it procure all the food grains? No. Does it procure from all the states? No. Does it procure from the, all the farmers? No. So this is the basic concept of MSP. Apart from this, MSP is announced uh, before the sowing season, that is before the sowing onset uh, of Kharif season as well as the Rabi season. So this is the basic concept of MSP. What about the loan waiver? Loan waiver in simple terms is nothing but uh, the loan which has to be repaid by the farmer will be waived off. I'll repeat the statement. The loan which has to be repaid by the farmer will be waived off. But please do not mistake the concept of a loan waiver with the loan cancellation. Loan waiver in simple terms means let's say here is a farmer, here is a bank. From this particular bank, the farmer has taken a loan of 100 rupees and let's say hypothetically he has repaid 20 rupees out of this. So he is yet to repay 80 rupees. The government, be it the state government or be it the central government, basically tells the bank not to recollect 80 rupees from the farmer because the government will repay the 80 rupees to the bank. So please understand, in case of a loan waiver, the debt is not cancelled the liability of the debt is transferred. Earlier, the liability of the debt fell on the head of the farmer. Now, this particular liability will be satisfied by the government. Again, it could be the state government or it could be the central government. In case of a loan cancellation, the bank itself says, uh, we will not collect or recollect this particular 80 rupees. So, there is a difference between the loan waiver as well as the loan cancellation. Do not confuse both of them. In the present context, what the state governments have been announcing is the loan waivers. It started with Uttar Pradesh elections and after that it has just snowballed and various state governments have been forced to announce loan waiver. And very recently, Mr. Rahul Gandhi has stated that if Congress comes to power post the 2019 elections in the center, they will be providing a loan waiver for all the agriculture loans, pan India. So, this is the reason this article was there in the newspaper. Now, what this particular newspaper says is simply this. Neither will the farmers get a benefit by increasing the MSP nor providing the loan waiver. Both are bad policies. Why? Please understand, very recently, government of India has increased the MSP. To what extent? The MSP has been increased to 150% of cost of production. But this particular amount that has been announced as a result of higher MSP, the calculation itself has been found to be faulty. That is, the farmers want MSP based on C2 comprehensive cost, whereas the cabinet or the government of India has announced the MSP based on A2 plus EFL. We have already discussed, as well as there is a video on this particular calculation of MSP itself, C2 will be much higher than A2 plus EFL. Or in simple terms, 
the farmers what they are getting through the concept of MSP wherein the cost of production is considered to be A2 plus FL is lesser if the cost of production was considered as C2. So basically one MSP calculation has been faulty or insufficient from the perspective of the farmers. Second, although the government of India may announce MSP, the markets will not decide their prices based on the MSP. In the recent itself, it has been found that the Kharif crops for which the government of India hiked the MSP to 150% of the cost of production, the market prices of all these particular Kharif crops has been much lesser than the MSP announced by the government. So in simple terms, government on one side says uh, we are providing higher benefit to the farmers by increasing the MSP to 150% of COP, but the ground reality is uh, completely different. The farmers are unable to get the benefit of this particular hike in the MSP. What about the loan waiver? Loan waiver is announced by the governments, be it the central government or state government, with an objective of uh, easing the distress in the agriculture sector, reducing the pressure on the agriculture sector, and to ensure that there is investment in the agriculture sector. Why do I say investment? Usually government says, in this particular example, the farmer would have repaid 80 rupees to the bank. Now the government says, uh, rather than farmer paying it, I will repay this particular 80 rupees. So this particular 80 rupees is the savings of the farmer and this particular farmer will invest this particular 80 rupees in the agriculture sector. That is, it will lead to capital formation in the agriculture sector. That is one of the very important objectives of the loan waiver. Now, various reports as well as surveys, notably the survey which was conducted by the World Bank has found that the objective of the government of India to increase the capital formation in agriculture sector through loan waivers will not work out. The report says that the government says this 80 rupees is the savings in the hands of the farmer but the farmer doesn't have this particular 80 rupees. That is the reason why he is not repaying the loan. So there is a question of saving 80 rupees in the hands of the farmer and the farmer investing this in the agriculture sector. So capital formation doesn't happen through the loan waivers. And apart from this, loan waiver will also lead to moral hazard argument. That is, please understand this. One, the banking sector is already under pressure. And at this particular point of time, if the state government announces a loan waiver, no doubt the amount is paid by the state, but there is a delay of this particular payment. As a result of this, the banks may start deviating as well as displacing these particular loans from one state to another state just to meet the conditions under the private sector lending. Second, the farmers who have already repaid the loan will feel bettered by this particular announcement of a loan waiver. And third, other farmers who have got the benefit already and are still defaulting on many other crop loans will start waiting for the next round of elections and will start defaulting very nearer to elections. So loan waivers will obviously lead to moral hazard argument. So this particular article says rather than announcing MSP or a higher MSP as well as a loan waiver, why don't you look into other solutions to provide benefits to farmers such as a cash subsidy which can be provided for the farmers the input subsidy which can be provided for the farmers, so on and so forth. So this is the gist of this particular article. The next article is related to currency swap agreement between India and Japan. Now very recently, both these particular countries have signed an currency swap agreement worth $75 billion. In case of a currency swap agreement, usually we see that two different companies from these two countries will sign up an agreement to exchange either the principal or interest. How this particular mechanism works, let's try and understand this. Let's say here is an Indian company X, here is a Japanese company Y. And within India, there is a bank A and within Japan, there is a bank B. Let's say for sake of understanding, 1 yen is equal to 10 rupees. Let's say Indian company X wants to borrow 10 yen but if they borrow from a Japanese bank, the rate of interest charged by this particular bank will be, let's say, 9%. Whereas the same 10 yen borrowed by a Japanese company from a Japanese bank, the rate of interest applicable will be 4%. I'm just using hypothetical numbers. On the other side, let's say this particular Japanese company Y wants to borrow 100 rupees in India. But if they borrow from an Indian bank, the rate of interest applicable will be, let's say, 7%. Whereas the same 100 rupees borrowed by an Indian company from an Indian bank, 
rate of interest applicable will be 5%. So in this particular situation, since the exchange rate is 1N is equal to 10 rupees and the amount or the principal that they both the companies want to borrow is the same, both these companies X and Y will enter into an agreement. X will borrow 100 rupees from Indian Bank A at 5% rate of interest and Y will borrow 10 yen from Bank B at 4% rate of interest. Whatever is the differential rate of interest will be exchanged between these two companies on a pre-specified date. So basically this particular agreement is called as currency swap agreement. What is the advantage? Advantage is X is getting access to 10 yen in Japan at a rate of interest of 4%. Whereas Y is getting access to 100 rupees at 5% rate of interest in India. So basically this is the understanding of a currency swap agreement. The benefit is uh, both these parties will get the benefit of a lower cost of capital or lower rate of interest. Now why it is there in the news? As already mentioned, India and Japan have signed an agreement that is a currency swap agreement worth 75 billion dollars. But please understand, this is not the first time that this kind of an agreement has happened between India and Japan. Earlier also, in the year 2008, there is a three-year agreement for a currency swap of $3 billion. Again in the year 2012, there was a three-year agreement for a currency swap agreement of $15 billion. And in the year 2013, there was another agreement between the Central Bank of Japan as well as RBI for 50 billion currency swap. So in the year 2018, the Indian government as well as the Japanese government have entered into an agreement of a currency swap for 75 billion. What is the advantage of these kind of an agreements? This will give more market access for enterprises from both the economies, the credit availability for the enterprises in both these markets will be cheaper. This will promote bilateral trade between these particular economies. That is the advantage of having a currency swap agreement. So this is the article which was there in the Hindu on 30th October 2018. So the next article is related to sovereign blue bond. This particular article though did not appear in any of the Indian newspapers. This is very important from perspective of UPSC exams. Let's try and understand what is this particular sovereign blue bond. But before understanding sovereign blue bond, let's try and understand the concept of Swayo Fish 3. Swayo Fish 3. Swayo Fish 3 is one of the programs which has been implemented by World Bank. This particular acronym basically stands for Southwest Indian Ocean Fisheries Program. I will repeat it, Southwest Indian Ocean Fisheries Program and this is the third such program or third such project which is being implemented by World Bank in the Southwest Indian Ocean. The concept of a sovereign blue bond in simple terms is nothing but uh, these bonds are the same as uh, the green bonds. In concept, these are as good as green bonds. In case of a green bonds, any amount that has been collected by a company by issuing these particular green bonds is used or is earmarked for usage of environment friendly project. Whereas in case of uh, a blue bond, go with the name any amount that is collected by issuing these kind of bonds will be used for development of fisheries or marine ecosystem now the seashells has become the first country in the world to issue blue bonds and this particular country has issued bonds worth 15 million dollars please understand it has become the first country in the world to issue sovereign blue bond what is the meaning of the sovereign? These are issued by a country. That is the reason the term sovereign is used. So Seashell has issued the blue bonds worth $15 million with a tenure of 10 years or with a maturity period of 10 years. Now what is the importance? Why this particular country has issued this particular kind of a blue bond? Please understand this. Seashell is a country where majority of the economy is dependent on this particular marine ecosystem itself. For example, 17% of the population is engaged in terms of economic activity or in terms of employment within this particular sector, that is the fishery sector. Second very important point, 95% of the exports from this particular country are in the form of the fish or the seafood itself. 
Third, the tourism which contributes heavily to this particular economy is very famous because of the marine ecosystem. And finally, the marine ecosystem will also provide a, a kind of food security as well as the nutrition availability to this particular country. And in the recent times, because of a huge focus on the fisheries, there is a fear that the fisheries ecosystem or the marine ecosystem, there has been a decline of it. That is a precise reason this particular country has decided to issue this particular blue bonds to regenerate or to reinvigorate this particular marine ecosystem. But please understand, apart from this particular 15 million, the World Bank has also provided a credit guarantee of 5 million. And apart from this, World Environment Facility has pledged 5 million dollars for this particular project. So, to put it in a nutshell, for the first time, Seychelles has become the country to issue a sovereign blue bond. The 15 million that will be raised by issuing these particular bonds will be used to protect, to manage the marine ecosystem around the Seychelles. And this is the third such project in the Southwest Indian Ocean to promote the fisheries ecosystem or marine ecosystem by World Bank. So these are some of the points related to sovereign blue bond. So these are some of the very important articles that have appeared in various business related newspapers. Now let's have a look at the questions. First question, consider the following statement. Seashells is the first country in the world to launch blue bonds. We have already seen, this is correct. Sweo Fish is a program launched by United Nations to promote sustainable fisheries. No, this is a program launched by World Bank. So first statement is correct. Second statement is wrong. Option A is the correct option. Second question, which of the following publishes Global Manufacturing Index? Some of the very important points are, one, this is published by World Economic Forum. Second point, as per the latest report, India has been ranked at 30th position, much below its competitors such as China, Thailand, etc. Third very important point, this particular report notes that India in the coming days will face two very important challenges. One is to ensure sustainable energy, that is a sustainable electric supply and second human labor usage. So these are three very important points associated with this particular report. So let's look at the options here. Which of the following publishes Global Manufacturing Index? The right option will be Option B, World Economic Forum. Third question, consider the following statements about the private sector lending. Now the very important points are, RBI mandates that 40% of the total credit given by a bank in a year has to go to agriculture sector, housing loan, education loans, export credit, SMEs, renewable energy projects, etc. Within this particular 40%, 18% has to go to agriculture sector and within this 18%, 8% has to be reserved for uh, marginal farmers. So under PSL, 18% of the credit has to go to agriculture sector. Yes, that's correct. Second, if the banks do not meet the targeted PSL, the shortfall has to be contributed by the bank to NIF. What is the meaning of this particular statement? Let's say hypothetically, the bank is mandated to meet 40%. And hypothetically, it meets only 38% of PSL. What about the shortfall of 2%? The statement says that this particular 2% has to be contributed by the bank to NIF. This particular statement is wrong. Why? This particular 2% has to be contributed or has to be given by the bank to RIDF, Rural Infrastructure Development Fund, which is maintained by NABARD. So it doesn't go to the NIF, rather it goes to RIDF. Now please understand, although I'm using 40% PSL here, right now the regulation is 40% for all the banks except those banks which are foreign banks and have got lesser than 20 branches in India. Right now the regulation is 32%. But please understand this, RBI last year has issued a notification and has stated that irrespective whether you're a foreign bank, Indian bank has less than 20 branches or more than 20 branches, by next couple of years, the PSL will be increased to 40%. That is all the banks irrespective whether they are foreign, Indian, less than 20 or more than 20, they will have to abide by 40% of the 
total credit in the form of PSL. This is the third question. So the right option uh, will be only A. That is only one is correct option A. Fourth question, consider the following statement about selfies bonds. Now please understand this. This selfie is a different selfie, not the normal selfie that we usually refer to. These are the novel types of bonds which were proposed very recently by a Nobel laureate, economic Nobel laureate by Robert Merton. The advantage of these particular selfies bonds is that these are future looking. That is, understand this, the selfies bonds will collect the money from you today, but the returns will be given to you after you retire. Usually these are very long term bonds. The recommendation of a tenure by this particular person who proposed this particular selfies bonds is 30 years. That is the tenure should be around 30 years. Let's say I invest in these particular bonds. These will be providing to me the returns after I retire. For how many years? That amount or that period shall be decided. This economist has recommended that take the average lifetime above the retirement age. For this particular period, you just decide the returns. That is, let's say average lifespan for Indians, let's say hypothetically is let's say 73 years and retirement age is 60 years. As per the recommendation given by the economist, the returns has to be spread in the next 13 years after the retirement. Now, please understand one very important feature is long term. Second important feature is they will provide to the returns to me after retirement. Third very important feature, these will be indexed with inflation. That is to ensure that the lifestyle remains the same or the lifestyle to a certain extent standards will be met. These particular bonds will give me the returns with indexation to inflation. These are very important features of these selfies bonds. So let's look at the points here. These will start providing the returns after the retirement age. Yes, correct. These will be indexed to inflation. Yes. Please understand this, these kind of bonds are very important for Indian economy. Why? For a simple reason, in case of India, there is a need of a longer term investment, especially in infrastructure. And if government of India starts proposing these particular selfies bonds to a certain extent, the pressure on the banking sector to finance these kind of long term projects will come down. And second, the investment will start flowing into infrastructure segment, which is required as of now. So first statement is correct. Second statement is correct. Option C is the right option. So both are correct. Finally, two descriptive questions based on the current affairs. One, the government needs to implement structural reforms in the agriculture sector to double the income of the farmers by 2022. No doubt, government of India has implemented some of the reforms, especially in the last three years. But having said so, many of these reforms are not structural in nature. So government of India needs to implement structural reforms to ensure that they achieve this particular objective of doubling the income of the farmers by 2022. This is the first question in 250 words. Second one, though the new data on direct tax shows that there has been an improvement in the receipts, there is a need of further reforms to ensure that Indian taxation systems become progressive. Already we have discussed the concept of a progressive taxation system and a regressive taxation system. That is in simple terms, if the majority of the tax collection are in the form of a indirect taxes which are universal in nature that is collected by government from every consumer in the market this taxation will be a regressive taxation system whereas in case of a progressive taxation system the contribution of direct taxes to total taxes will be much much higher for example in case of oecd economies two-thirds of the total taxes collected will come from the direct taxes whereas in case of india overall more than 50 percent of the taxes collected come from indirect taxes so there is a need of a further reforms to ensure that Indian taxation system becomes progressive in nature rather than regressive. So this is the second question, elaborate 250 words. Now, before I end this particular session, I just want to give you a list of the novel types of bonds which are there in the newspapers in the last couple of months. Again, having said so, some of these particular bonds are there in existence for a very long period of time. And some of the bonds such as Masala bonds, the question has already been asked by UPSC in the last couple of years. But expect question on any of these particular types of bonds in the UPSC prelims 2019 or even in the mains descriptive question in 2019 mains. So what are these particular bonds? I've just given a list. Just go through or make some notes related to these particular bonds. One is 81 and 82 bonds. 
These are additional tire one, additional tire two bonds. Very recently, these bonds were in the newspapers. Why? The banks to meet the Basel guidelines have been issuing these 81 and 82 bonds. These are very specific types of bonds. Please go through this. Second, municipal bonds. These have been proposed to ensure that there is a sufficient amount of funding available for these cities which have been identified as smart cities. Because please understand, to convert a city into a smart city, there will be a huge need of financing for infrastructure. One of the ways of raising money for this infrastructure financing will be through municipal bonds. Third one will be impact bonds. We have already seen this particular concept of impact bonds in one of the economic this week discussion. Selfies bonds, we have seen it in today's discussion itself. Blue bonds, again in today's discussion. NRI bonds, in today's discussion. Uday bonds were recently in the newspaper. These are the bonds which are issued by the discounts or the state government to be more precise under the concept of Uday, Ujjwal Discount Assurance Yojana. Next, Kisan Rath bonds are again associated with the, the loan waiver. These have been issued by Uttar Pradesh government. Masala bonds, we have discussed a lot related to this. And finally, IBIS, Inflation Index bonds. These are again in the newspaper very recently, uh, wherein the government of India is contemplating issuing uh, another round of inflation index bonds. So these are more than 10 types of uh, very novel bonds which have been there in the newspaper in the recent times. Please go through these particular types of bonds, make notes on this. So this is a total discussion related to economy this week for a time period of 26th October to 1st of November. Thank you.